how to evaluate wide receiver prospects and talking through some of the most intriguing 2024 names. That's what we're talking about today on Stealing Bananas. I'm Ben Gretsch. You can find the Stealing Signals newsletter at bengretsch.substack.com. With me, as always, is Sean Siegel. You can find all of his fantastic work at Rotoviz and all of his fantastic work on this particular topic in the Rotoviz Rookie Guide, which is an awesome resource. I, I wrote a lot about that at Stealing Signals in a piece I did this week, which I, I, I leaned on it heavily, Sean. Um, tremendous work from you guys. For anyone who's had past editions of the Rotoviz Rookie Guide, I mentioned this. You have mentioned this on a recent show that you thought it was the, the best one yet. Um, I think there's no question the way that you guys have evolved that over the years and, and how you formatted it and, and had it this year is uh, super fun to consume and get through. And I, I really enjoy it. Well, I appreciate you saying that it, uh, it was fun. We've mostly gotten good feedback, Ben. it's always funny because we did have somebody um, chime in and said they had purchased all seven rookie guides and this might be the last one. Cause they didn't care for it. So you know, we are always going to get feedback. <laughs> Well, so that's what's funny. What's funny about that is like, and we talk about this, um, and I, I wrote about this a little bit in the introduction on the Stealing Signals post, but there are a lot of consumers in the fantasy space, and I can talk about this openly on the Stealing Bananas because anyone who sits and listens to us every week, Sean, is probably not a, a, a somebody that fits into this category, but all they want is the lists. They want the ranks. They want the who do I target? Who do I fade? They don't want to learn a lot of the context. They don't want to know about probabilistic thinking. They just want yes, no, maybe so. And you guys kind of went away from that a little bit, which is something that I love. I mean, there's there's ranks in there. Don't get me wrong. There's there's mock drafts that you guys did and, and the um, cumulative ADP and all of that stuff. But what I love about it is your write-ups for every player that are providing context about that player's path. I'm always talking about the long view over at the newsletter their path through college. I talk about the long view in terms of when we evaluate these players at the NFL level, we consider their prospect profile still. We consider their their whole long you know career. I don't follow college football enough to have an idea of whether these guys are late risers, whether they were you know big prospects out of high school. You have a write up for every player. You're talking about where they were coming out of high school, if they transferred, where you know when they transferred in their college journey, where they went. It's easy to just get caught looking at the numbers, and this is what they did each of these years in you know the different apps and tools at Rotoviz and elsewhere, and not get that context of what the shape of their college career was. What does it mean for some? There's three years of data, and you're like, oh, well, they were an early declare. Well, well actually, they were a redshirt, and so they weren't actually an early declare. They you know they just don't have data for that first year. Um, so anyway, I love that. I think you need that holistic view. We're going to talk a lot about this type of stuff on the, on the show, but in terms of being able to actually analyze effectively, there are no one-stop shop stats that can solve everything, particularly at wide receiver, which is such a fun position to evaluate. It's so skill oriented, but there are so many different types of receivers. We talk about this all the time. Obviously you have to understand how to evaluate the different types as well. That's what we always try and do on the show, obviously. We love the feedback that's like, you know, you're not just teaching us to fish, you're teaching us how to fish. And that's the, you know, the, the phrase that always gets, or not just giving us a fish, teaching us how to fish. <laughs> that's the phrase that always gets kind of thrown. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly what we do. We'll teach you how to fish multiple times. Then you'll be fishing for two lifetimes. Um but that's the phrase that always gets thrown around. And I think that's the opposite of what people want. Like you said, you know, whenever you do content, you get, you get different types of feedback. I'm sure that individual probably just preferred some of the more, um, didn't prefer to read all of the context and just wanted to know. Well, I think that the, the feedback on that one did kind of skew in the direction of wanting some of the things that I put into the individual player pieces kind of separated out by position in a way that you could look at it not with the individual players. And so I can understand that, right? I mean, different people are going to need different things at different times. But as you mentioned, I think it's helpful to understand the path. I think it's especially helpful to understand the path and potentially important to understand the path for this class because this is still a class that is impacted by the pandemic. And the impacts that that had on individual people are going to be very different. 
because how it was handled in different programs, how it was handled in different people's families, everybody didn't have the same experience of that. Now, one of the things that we know is people didn't have the same experience in different programs across the country in a lot of different ways. You know, you get different coaches, different QBs, all types of different things you're dealing with. But one of the things that has always been relevant, and then last year was such a unique type of season where we have a lot of rookies who had actually been in college for a long time come to the NFL and are fantastic, which isn't necessarily what we've seen. One of the things that you know came out of some of the early research at Rotoviz was this idea of breakout age, certainly this idea of early declare. There are elements where we know the guys who were able to outperform their peers before they get so old that they're kind of taking advantage of younger guys and they've had more experience, they've had more chances, all of those types of things. We know that it's helpful to be a young dominant player. And yet I think you want to be aware of a, how some of those loopholes are going to be closed by the NFL eventually. And it's going to be difficult except in hindsight to know when that happens in terms of adjusting for where they're actually picked right? Because draft slot is going to come into play. But the other thing is just, you can't treat these guys and, and last year's guys, I think in the exact same way that we've always treated players because their collegiate experiences were different. And so, and then the other thing too, we are going to have much more in the way of transfers now. And so to be able to work through, you know, when these guys came in, where they were as prof, as recruits, and then how they moved through their timeframes, that was helpful for me. And one of the things that I wanted to do was to contribute to the guide in a way that was helpful for me to learn that had information that I would want to know as, you know, as a reader, as a subscriber, as a purchaser, what have you. And one of the things that you and I have talked about, Ben, is that we feel like we do the best content when we're focused on projects that kind of grab us and we're enthusiastic about, we have excitement about, like we want to know the answers ourselves. And so for me, this kind of reinvigorated my sort of spirit for the prospects and for, you know, fantasy football after, you know, what is kind of a grind when you go through the end season portion. I'm glad that you enjoyed it because, I mean, if anybody were to enjoy it, the people that I sort of care about the most and appreciate there and have the most respect for their you know, how they work through things. Anyway, I appreciate you saying that. It was it was a fun experience. Well, and, uh, and I'm not just saying that. I mean, I, I, again, I wrote about this in an intro to my post at uh, Stone Signals this week, but it's it, it gets to this point of something we wanted to talk about, which is how we evaluate these players and what we're trying to do. And so it's important to work through this. And then whether that's, you know, advertising the rookie guide or not, I mean, the point is why did I like it so much is relevant and the reason it's relevant, the reason if you read over at Stealing Signals that I love the targets per out run stat and how I use it is it, I, I have, I've done my post this this offseason. We talked about them on the show, that the targets per out run post where I went through every offense, really breaking down the receiving profile of each player. I've seen the pushback on targets per run as a stat. Um and in any per route run stat, there's there's some you know context that needs to be added. There's uh, some really interesting research that's been done on targets per route run, yards per route run, in relation to like formations, how many wide receivers are on the field. If you're in a heavy formation, uh, if you're in a five wide formation, how it can be, how that can lead to more spread in a in a tighter formation. The pass attempts can lead to more uh, concentration of targets, and so we should maybe adjust and. All of those types of things are very, very relevant. There's uh, also really important relevance to uh, depth of target. Harder to, to earn a target 20 yards downfield. It takes longer, right, to get out there than uh, certainly on a jet motion tip pass. You're you're earning a target just by uh, existing. It's more like a handoff. Uh, so all of that type of context is very important. You have some guys who are just rotational players. They're only really on the field when they're getting those types of jet motion design plays. So they're per route run stuff, quote unquote, is going to look very inflated. Uh, they're not really earning that volume necessarily. They're, they're just kind of getting it doled out. All of that type of stuff is relevant. And I think that's important um, as it relates to that stat. I think the, the point I would make is that every single stat, like there are fantasy analysts, there are listeners to this pod, probably more casual players, what have you, that have hoped to find a stat 
that can incorporate all the things that we think are, are really important and can give us yes or no binary answers about whether or not we should be in on a player or not in on a player. And the reality of football is that just doesn't exist. You just talked about it in the scope of a college player's career at the lower level. And, and certainly for this class, as it's still impacted by the pandemic, that's significant. We also have the, you know, significant rise in, in transfers, which also, I, I mean, is a second order thing that even as we get through the classes that were impacted by the pandemic is going to influence analysis going forward more than it did 10 years ago when Rotoviz was first really starting to, to crush the prospect analysis game. We didn't have the same type of transfers. And when, when someone did transfer, it was way more of a, um, like they, it was probably a bad, a really bad sign. They, they weren't able to get on the field at the first place because it was punitive. They then had to sit out a year and it was horrible. Now it's like, they might just not want to play on that team anymore. They're not getting enough NIL money or whatever, right? They can just be a free agent almost in the college space. So it's, it's a, it's a lot different to consider the signal of these things as, as time moves on, as things evolve. Um, but at the NFL level, the reason I like targets prior on so much, and, and I think this is an, an important element to whatever stat is you're choosing, because ultimately all football stats are a small sample, man, like 17 games is not a long time. And ultimately the ways that NFL seasons, we talk about how they're chaos, the way that they evolve, the fact that some, you know, wide receivers, since we're talking about that position, but every position has these types of things. Some wide receivers are going to deal with their quarterback going down for four weeks or something. How did that influence it? Some are going to deal with a, a, a firing midseason of their head coach. How did that deal with then what was implemented offensively and those types of things? One of the things that I feel fortunate, I guess, about, or, or I try to do, or I think that I do well or what have you, is in, in writing stealing signals and in watching all the games every week, and we talk about this during the season, Sean, you and I both are this way. We are trying to get a very intimate view of all 32 NFL teams, what their their goals are, what their scheme is, what their coach wants, what their players are, how their players are being used. All of that stuff informs the stats. You can't just take any stat and compare it player to player without you know using some context for the offense they're in, the situation, the scheme, all those things. Although we do know that there is signal in the ways that coaches are playing these players for the most part in the aggregate, certainly good players show it off in practice enough that their coaches are going to play them. That doesn't mean that there aren't specific situations where the coaches make bad decisions or the players are good enough, but aren't getting playing time or bad players are getting playing time for reasons that we don't really understand. Maybe they're good locker room guys, whatever. It doesn't mean that everything is neat and perfect, but in the aggregate, it is certainly the case that we'd like to, to believe that behind closed doors, the really good players earn their playing time. They find ways in practice, and, and it's so obvious that they get out there. And that tends to be the case in terms of you know guys that struggle to even get on the field and all that kind of stuff typically don't just break out at some new place later. There, there's an issue for some reason. The point is, Understanding all of that context is very, very important for each of the specific situations. And I know it's like, it's basically saying, oh, you have to do a, a massive amount of research on every single player to be able to have an opinion on anything. I'm not trying to say that, but I do think if you want to be as accurate as possible, you have to understand all of that context. That's what is so interesting about football analysis. So when I write about like the targets per outrun stuff, I like to use that as the foundational piece because I think I've talked about this on the show before, but I think targets per route is a very simple thing. I know what's going into that stat. It's very predictive of itself year over year. It's very sticky. That doesn't mean that every player's targets per outrun profile is going to be identical. The low ADOT guys, the high ADOT guys, the usage within the scheme, the, the, the you know designed short passes or jet motion tip passes like I was referencing are all going to influence the actual specific numbers within those different offenses. And you need to, to understand that. But if you use that as a foundational skill, earning volume, and the other huge element is then what do you do with that volume? How efficient are you after the target? How many yards can you gain per target? Which yards per target is a stat that gets hammered a lot, but how many touchdowns can you gain per target after you've earned that volume? And that stuff, the, the yards per target and targets per outrun comes together to go into yards per outrun, which people love as a stat. I'm saying all of this to say that for college players, Sean, I can't do that. I don't have the intimate knowledge of all of the college teams and how they they run and 
how good their quarterback is and all of that stuff. Like one of the things I loved is reading about the two Texas receivers who we'll probably talk about um, because they're both projected to be first round picks and how their quarterback Quinn Ewers, who was uh, I believe a true freshman in 2022 was kind of, kind of struggled in some ways. And has been kind of, every time I hear that guy's name, somebody has a different opinion about him, but was a really high profile quarterback, but inconsistent, I think is sort of the, 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 the consensus opinion how that influences those players. It's just, it's not a lot different than on an NFL level, how I might adjust for Garrett Wilson having to deal with Zach Wilson, which I'm not saying Quinn Ewers is as bad as Zach Wilson, but I make those adjustments on the NFL level because I watch all the games and I know how bad Zach Wilson is, right? And so getting that information so that I can contextualize the stats because a lot of people just take the, the prospect class they look at whatever their favorite stat is, whatever it is. Yards per team attempt is the is the sexy one lately. They just rank the yards per team attempt or they put it into a chart and they say, look at these guys that are popping above average and look at these guys that are below average. Like that's going to give you everything you need to know. And it's not. And it, it's it's good research, but it's not going to get you to the correct conclusion as frequently as you you need to be able to add context to then apply it in a way that's going to help you make better predictions. That's the stuff that the road of a rookie guy is going to give you. That's the stuff that I think is important with any analysis you do in football. And it's interesting that you kind of frame it that way, because one of the elements that I've talked about for a decade now, but just becomes increasingly important for me is this element of humility. And I think that the fuller the picture that you try and create, the more humility you're going to have. Or in some cases, the more pieces that you put together, like the more confidence you might get in a certain guy, that you know could be problematic. But if you're looking at it from a variety of perspectives and you're continuing to come back with, yeah, this guy is really, really good. I think that's more helpful than seeing it in one number. I mean, the danger of one number is immense right and so you know as we go through these different players and we're profiling them and trying to look at elements like what is the yards per team attempt as you mentioned we can also look at you know where are their yards per route i mean is this a guy like a puka where very strangely the route percentage was down now one of the elements with that that it kind of works both directions where if you have someone like a quentin johnston who has good yard per route numbers you're also kind of wondering like why is TCU not emphasizing him even more with that being the case? So it's not again a, a simple answer, but I think having that information and being able to work through what you think and what some of the other pieces tell you. You can look at you know which players are succeeding in which areas. You can look at which players are succeeding compared to their teammates. One of the elements that we look at with the dominator rating, and it's interesting because you know yards per team attempt and the relationship between that and where the person is eventually drafted is going to be something that I think you're going to want to be aware of. Certainly if you're doing a lot of drafts, which you can do now prior to the NFL draft, you're going to be want to be aware of how that's going to give you a sense of what the teams are thinking. The dominator rating, which really came out of the fantasy douches research again, you know, more than a decade ago. And I think it's cool just how much of his stuff has held up so well, you know, through the ages, but it's this idea of, you know, when you have the draft slot, then which players are more likely to, you know, overperform or underperform. And so I think that you're really looking at slightly different things, but then you're also looking at slightly different things from the perspective of there are going to be teams with elite players at the QB position and then multiple receiving positions where obviously the market share that you get as a receiver there is going to be lower. You're hoping that this per play efficiency is going to be extremely high. Conversely, when you're looking at some of these players who play in much more limited offenses, if you have a guy who is you know, on a, on a bland, somewhat unsuccessful team, he's got a bad QB, but he also doesn't have a ton of competition. I mean, what you're trying to find there is someone who is producing a huge share of whatever they get 
his quarterback play is not necessarily going to allow him to put up the stats of a Marvin Harrison or a Malik Neighbors, but he needs to pop in that area, right? And then he needs to be able to do some of the other things that we have in the guide and people can look at in terms of, you know, how are you doing on on on-target catches? How are you doing after the catch? Are you breaking tackles? Are you forcing missed tackles? Having that full picture to me is helpful in terms of maintaining humility, in terms of avoiding getting all in on someone who actually does have some red flags, but then also, you know, if there is a guy who continues to come to the top in basically everything and has maybe done it over multiple seasons, right? Because simply looking at the last year is also going to be misleading for us. Having that full picture doesn't mean that we're going to be right. One of the things that you see is the NFL teams who obviously have a lot of incentive to do it well have struggled with this. One of the things that we see is that while draft slot is going to get you early routes, and in some cases it's going to get you early targets, it's not going to protect you from being a bad player. Right? We've got all kinds of first round busts because you actually have to be able to execute certain things as a receiver that even I don't think the running back position has to do. Right? You get that handoff as a running back, you run forward, you take advantage of what the line has done. Maybe you break a couple of tackles or you run the daylight occasionally. Even if you're not actually providing any value, if you're drafted early enough, I mean, you're going to keep getting sun out there. And one of the things that we see is, you know, with someone like Anashi Harris, for example, you're just, you can't get that level of protection as a wide receiver. You're going to have to be good. And I think not only is it more fun to have more information, but I think it's helpful to have more information, both in terms of really going through and using the sieve to get the very best guys, but then also not getting so caught up in or being pushed into this area where you make some mistakes and because someone pops in one stat, you end up with this extremely high percentage in your best ball or you have them in all of your dynasty leagues. And then you're looking at it a year later thinking like, what have I done? And then you're trying to figure out why you went wrong. You apply that to one specific reason and you say, I'm never going to make that one mistake again. And it's not, it's a, it's always, multiple things it's always a specific i i mean you, you said so many interesting things there um that, that i had so many thoughts on but th- the the first thing just is this idea that that you as you were closing that, I, that hit me is this idea of misapplying the aggregate to the specific we have these aggregate research numbers these areas that we know that these things matter in the aggregate I, I don't think enough analysts think through why, right? Like I mentioned the yards per route run point where different numbers of wide receivers that are out in a route, there's potentially five eligible receivers on a play. If you have five, el- you know, five wide receivers on the field, they're all going to be out in a route. If you only have one wide receiver on the field, then you, the only other eligible options, unless teams playing a sixth offensive lineman or tight ends and running backs, those positions aren't always out in a route. They're often blocking Also, when you get into those formations where you have maybe three tight ends on the field, you're far more likely to run. And so then the times when you do pass, it's actually catching the defense off guard a little bit. It's probably way more likely. It's not probably. It's certainly way more likely to be a a play action as a percentage of the total pass attempts, which is a higher efficiency play. A lot of play action plays out of those big formations only send like two routes downfield and they keep the other three in the the run fake in, in a blocking scheme. And so, yeah, like the ball's going to go to the to the one guy off the play action that's running the route downfield or one of the two guys. That type of context is super relevant. It's not, um, you know, I saw that, I thought, misapplied then to Lad McConkey, who ran a lot of routes in low wide receiver formations because you have to apply the context that Brock Bowers is not a typical tight end in that offense at Georgia, right? Like he's running a lot of routes. The point of this is saying, these formations work this way with, or, uh, you know, with fewer wide receivers that the pass attempts get more concentrated because of what that means to the, the sport of football, what I just described about the big formations. And that's more likely to be run heavy. And then you're, you know, it's, it, we're only looking at the number of, of plays out of these formations that become passes, but we're not really focused on the, the pass run split and all of that stuff. But Brock Bowers, just because he's classified as a tight end, well, I mean, he splits out when they go to five wide, right? So now, you know, when Georgia's in those formations, I mean, he's more of a threat to Lad McConkey's target share than whatever additional wide receiver is in the four wide receiver formation for a different offense. I, this is just one hyper-specific point, but we learned the aggregate lesson and we need to then 
figure out the right way to apply it to the specific because there's always context like that in football. The more that you do in this space, the, the 10 years that I've been doing this now, um, the more clear it becomes that you have to be, again, it's, it's the humility point that you just made, but you have to be willing to consider new information at all points down the line. There is no miracle cure. There's no snake oil that's going to solve everything for you. The people that are successful in this spend a lot of time understanding the different profiles. And then price is the part that, that plays in, in fantasy football, right? Like, you were talking about um, Puka Nakua and Quentin Johnston and some of those things. Well, Quentin Johnston, for a first-round receiver, you're like, why is this dude never out there as much as you would expect him to be for like the full route share? That seems like a problem for a guy that we're saying is a superstar versus Puka Nakua when you had to make the decisions on draft day last year. It's the very end of the draft. It's like, well, this is an intriguing per route profile. Maybe BYU is doing some weird stuff, right? Like it's a different conversation when you're talking about a late round receiver who's then a late round pick in fantasy football versus the first round receiver going in the single digit rounds of redraft leagues and the first round of, of dynasty startups and all of those things. And, and I mean, that's not to say, I mean, obviously like, you know, I, I was in on Quinn Johnson last year. That's not to say that like mistakes can't be made, but when we look at that in hindsight and try to understand the specific mistakes and, and things that are made, we have to be honest as analysts. We have to be um, willing to look at all of the elements, I think. And that's so important. Um, you said that a lot of different ways. And I just, uh, yeah, I just, I thought that was really well said. So let's kind of dive into looking at the individual players now, Ben. Do you have any like big picture takeaways that you want to share to set the stage because i mean one of the things that people you know most listeners are going to know and and certainly if you're kind of starting your research one of the things to know in terms of the shape of this class certainly from a dynasty perspective but it filters into the rest of the formats as well is that we have a lot of interesting quarterbacks and interesting, I think, from the perspective of some of them having very wide <laughs> outcome ranges. And that part is fun because you have these QBs who could be, you know, a year or two years from now could be the number one player in all of Dynasty Superflex. Or they could be Bryce Young or Zach Wilson and be more or less, I mean, Bryce Young, hopefully not completely gone, but players who lose an immense amount of value right away, right? Mm -hmm. That portion is interesting because it then also pushes down a variety of players. The running back position is very weak, although the secondary group, quite interesting, right? We did a Rotoviz OT show, Colum and I, with Travis May recently. Anybody who's interested in that, Travis made the case for some running backs that I like. And so, you know, anytime someone comes on and says what you want to hear, it gets you fired up again. That's a problem potentially in that humility direction. But when we look at these wide receivers, it appears that there are six, maybe seven guys who will go in the first round of the reality draft. And if we get that, then just right off the bat, those players, number one, become very interesting in best ball. And number two, I mean, you're now talking about a full first round of rookie picks that people are going to value very highly. Yeah, and you that's, I think, the, the huge thing when you said kind of the big picture stuff. I haven't done a ton of running back research yet, um, but the consensus is more or less that none of the running backs are on the, you know, elite level. Uh, you have potentially elite quarterbacks like you just talked about, some really intriguing names at the top, and then even a really interesting second tier, frankly, that if you go over to grinding the mocks right now, you look at like the Bonix and Michael Penix names, they're both expected to go in like the middle of the first round on average right now, which is I, I was a little bit surprised by when I was digging into it a little bit. I think that their averages were like 12 and, and 18 or something like that 
pick 12 and 18. And I think that probably we're going to get one of those guys in and the second one will fall into the second. Fall to the second. Yeah. It, so that'd it, be my it, guess. Yeah. It's always like that with the quarterbacks where they either go in the top half of the first round or then in the back half of the first round, you have the good teams that have their quarterbacks in place and they have other positions and they're looking at the elite players at defense and that. And then, you know, last year, Will Levis, people were talking about him going in the top five and then he ends up going like 201 or whatever it was to the, you know, as soon as you get back to the bad teams, <laughs> then it's like, all right, well, he's going to go. Um, so yeah, we'll see how that goes at quarterback, but I, I, you know, a lot of names there, I think, you know, for, for dynasty rookie drafts, the way that I'm looking at it right now is like you, especially in Superflex, obviously you have some quarterbacks that are definitely worth those top picks, which, um, you know, in Superflex typically means they're going to go before anything else, but then you also have wide receivers who, arguably should go before any of the quarterbacks because they're that good of wide receiver prospects you have. And, and then you also have a tight end prospect who people are calling the best tight end prospect of all time. It's, it's a little reminiscent of the Jamar chase Cal Pitts year where we're like, yeah, we have this uh, generational wide receiver and this generational tight end at the same time, except we probably have two generational wide receivers. That. I mean, we've been Kyle Pitts fans, right? There is no comparison between Kyle Pitts and Brock Bowers. I mean, I'm very tempted. The the problem is just that, I mean, if the quarterback hits, he's so valuable. Brock Bowers is the best prospect in this class. The best prospect in the class. So there you go. There's, I mean, Sean, there's not enough. uh, I don't know how many generations there are, but we have too many generational prospects to discuss. (laughs) Clearly that's a word that's a little bit overused these days. um, And I'm, I'm throwing it around. Then I'm going to say hyperbole never goes out of style. So. Never. Everybody's generational. But the the point is when you go into these rookie mock drafts, the first like five picks, six picks are, are all potentially like the, you can make a strong case. It should be the 102 in a lot of other classes, right? Just like a couple of years ago, maybe uh, the year when we didn't have any quarterbacks and stuff. I mean, who's the 106? It's like Jaden Daniels at this point or Drake May, which, I mean, if you're saying that Harrison and Neighbors and Bowers all belong ahead of those guys, um, I still really love Roma Dunze. Going through my targets per run research, I had to, you know, very much acknowledge that he's just not on the same level as Neighbors and Harrison. I, I always think in terms of tiers, but going through it, you know, I sort of expected Harrison to not have the ridiculous, like, he's one of those guys that has been hyped so much that you um, sort of think that maybe it's more that the film people really love all of his skills and all that stuff, but he played in the big 10 where like sometimes the offenses are not as explosive, obviously Ohio state's offenses, but um, he also then is playing with some really good additional players. And so you're like, yeah, I'm probably going to be a little bit over underwhelmed by like the per route run stuff. Cause he's had competition and stuff. That's not the case. You go look at Marvin Harrison's numbers his true freshman year, he was playing behind three future first round picks. He doesn't do a lot, but the second, the very next year, he's at an absolutely elite level of target earning and volume earning at a high A dot, way more vertical than I think I expected. Maybe just from my perception of his dad, Marvin Harrison Sr., was a little bit more of a possession player, not so vertical. Um, and then he comes back in his junior year this past year, and, and then he's in early declare, but his, his second and third year, phenomenal he, he took a step forward in his third year and you're like this is like these are crazy figures in terms of the targets per route run at the a dot i have the stat the weighted targets per route run that i like to look at they both seasons are massive they're a better than the best season of almost every other prospect um they're both better than the best season of malik neighbors neighbors is a big story in in, in three seasons is that his third year he really takes off. His first two years are good, but not necessarily great. But even his third year doesn't match in a volume earning perspective, Harrison. But then he's massively efficient in a way that actually gives him like a, the yards per out run stuff is is better than some of Harrison's seasons. And so there's people that are saying that neighbors should be ahead of Harrison. That like, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here talking about how good Harrison is and he's been the chosen one since you know birth i guess because he he is a hall of famer son and then you have neighbors whose final season now for me the big difference between the two is that he only really had the one monster year harrison did it twice and the only other year harrison played he was behind 
three future first round picks. Like I said, didn't really get on the field and you can understand that basically every opportunity he got, he was at an elite level. Neighbors had to kind of build up to it. That's a different profile for me. The point is they're both fantastic wide receiver prospects. And then I think a Dunze's profile, I would, I would defend it. And I think it's really, really strong. So when you're talking about the overarching thing, I found the top three to be boring when I got through it. Cause I was like, you can't really have a, t- a take here. I don't think you can. Like, I think Harrison is as advertised. He belongs ahead of neighbors who is as advertised. He belongs ahead of a Dunze who I also think is a very, very good prospect. And I want to you know, say is, you know, belongs in the, in the discussion, but he doesn't really belong in the discussion with those two. I like to think in terms of tiers, it's, it's very clear to me, one, two, three in that order. But then, as you said, there's, potentially seven first round wide receivers. If you go over to um, grinding the mocks and you look at their current looks at expected draft position, there are 10 wide receivers in the first two rounds and all, all of them are, I think before pick 40 in average expected draft position. Yeah. They're all before pick 35. So a lot of these ones that aren't even being mocked in the first round are being mocked in those first picks of the second round on average. Um, And so to me, it's like, I'm curious what you what you have to say about those top three, but it's like those top three that are all being talked about as top 10 picks are as advertised. They probably should be ranked the same for everyone. I think it's getting a little cute to not rank them the same for everyone. And then the real discussion starts in like wide receiver four to wide receiver 10, where you're, we're going to probably get draft capital for maybe all of these guys, maybe not all of them, maybe similar to your point about the quarterbacks, a couple of them slip into round, deeper into round two or into round three even. But if they all go by like pick 50 and, and say between pick 20 and pick 50, they're not top 20 picks. If we get a, a ton of wide receivers in that range, the order that they go in won't matter quite as much. And there are some profiles in there I really, really like and some profiles I don't like, but there, there's going to be good draft capital for each. Um, that's, I think, where it's like, who do we want to be in on? Who do we want to be out on? You know? But what do you think about the top three? Like, do you think I accurately broke that down? I'm curious. No, I think so. It is an element here where if you have that like 105 or 106, then you're starting to get some really aggressive trade offers for those picks. Because if your particular league has, you know, Jaden Daniels fall to the 105 range and you're going to get like Lamar Jackson, but a better passer. Or you're going to get Drake May and get Josh Allen, but, well, not as good as Josh Allen. (laughs) (laughs) You're going to get a poor man's Josh Allen then people are going to be pretty excited about that. But if the quarterbacks go where you would maybe mildly expect, then, I mean, you're potentially going to get like one of the two best receiver prospects in a long time, or you're going to get Brock Bowers, the guy who is maybe the best prospect in the entire draft. And so I think when we're talking about, you know, how we should rank them, we have to consider those things. So you, mentioned Marvin Harrison, just how good he's been, right? And and to put a few numbers to that, we're talking about a 67, 12, 11, and 14 line with 18 yards per reception, because especially in 2023, he's getting deep at an extremely high rate. Now, one of the things that you might even, you know, put a tiny bit of a red flag on there is that even though the offenses are different, I mean, one of the things that Jalen Hyatt did last year, right, was get over the top, score a lot of long touchdowns. Jalen Hyatt is a freakish athlete. He showed some of that with the Giants, but mostly struggled. I mean, everybody listening is going to be, you know, screaming about how that's apples and oranges, right? But we do want to consider the fact that he's getting over the top of some of these defenses. But you're over 3.2 yards per team attempt, which is an insane number. You've got a dominator rating of 45%, which, I mean, part of that is showing that the rest of the Ohio State receiving core that previously had been part of these, like, legendary recruiting classes was actually pretty disappointing. But you're going through there and you're seeing crazy numbers for Marvin Harrison. 
the other thing that we know, and kind of Travis mentioned this on the show the other day, but from the on-field tracking, we know that Marvin Harrison is extremely athletic and that we would expect his ability to beat defenses deep is going to translate. And one of the things that you and I talk about a lot is that figuring out how to get these splash plays, figuring out how to score at the NFL level in the contemporary environment without having to run a 15 to 17 play drive is something that offenses are going to need to prioritize and offenses who have figured it out like the dolphins at least figured it out in some instances are going to have some advantages so i think you just have to be extremely fired up about marvin harrison it's one of the reasons why when you hear teams like the cardinals and the chargers who desperately desperately need receiver help and there are at least i mean the cardinals have come right out and said it uh ben you can correct me if i'm wrong on this you get the impression that that's also true for the chargers or else you know they might even just take an offensive lineman because you know they would prefer to run for 200 yards a game there are problems i think with that potential approach if you have a player of this caliber that fits both your team need and it fits what is so imperative in the modern NFL. So I like that part of it. But I'm going to go ahead and... Yeah, I mean, if you're the Cardinals and you have a chance to draft the next Larry Fitzgerald, you have that guy, right? Like, I mean, that's that's a comparison I've, I've seen made for for Harrison. If you want to, like, think about, like, not just comparing him to his dad or something, but, like, that's the type of college player he was. That's the type of profile, the athleticism, and the skill that all comes together you had him in Arizona, Larry Fitzgerald. He played like 20 years for you. I mean, he played forever. Not 20 years, but 15 really high-level seasons. I don't care if your roster's not great right now. You're going to go through different iterations of your roster with that guy on. If a wide receiver's that good, you're certainly never going to let him hit free agency. You're going to extend him and all of those things. You want to be the one who drafts him. You can't acquire that type of a wide receiver. We don't see those guys available. Um if you want to trade for one, you have to give up a lot, typically. So anyway, yeah, I mean, it, I it love was, trading it, back, and I think that you know you build juggernauts, powerhouses by trading back. I would be reluctant to trade out of the range where you can select one of these two guys because I'm going to get too cute for you and make the case for neighbors as number one. <laughs> We, we've got to. I was. Who, I I knew you were being like. I I thought what you were gonna do is take someone else ahead of a Dunze when you started kind of having that smile on your face, that little smirk. But it's neighbors over Harrison is where you're going with it. All right, I'm excited for this. I'm excited for this. So what we're getting with neighbors is a guy who comes out and in his sophomore season, he goes for over a thousand yards. He leads the squad with 2.6 yards per route, which again, one of the things here, we're going to try not to mention like two specific numbers that often, but I'll be referencing the sports info solution numbers that are in the rookie guide. Then you'll occasionally be referencing um, some PFF numbers, that, which are different. And so we want to take that into consideration. But the key thing for me here is that he's a full yard for, per route above Keishawn Boutte, which is still some enthusiasm for him probably not after his rookie year, but kind of going into the draft, going into um, the Patriots. And perhaps if he had played for a team that wasn't such a complete train wreck, there would have been something different there. But then also Brian Thomas, right? And I think that that part is kind of interesting when we look at this idea that Brian Thomas now is also potentially being looked at as a top 15 pick. And I know that you have some skepticism there, but when we're talking about Thomas and some of the things that he accomplished as also a freak athlete, as someone who's been an elite touchdown scorer, as someone who's been able to get over the top and just the contrast between these players is so significant, right? When we're looking at 2023 neighbors goes well over a hundred yards per game over a touchdown per game, his yards per team attempt goes from 2.1 to 3.8, man. Right. I mean, insane numbers. His dominator rating within the context of this team that has Brian Thomas is up there at 34%. Now, a little bit of that, again, is because you have Jaden Daniels, who like potentially could be a historic talent in his own right. The issue there, of course, that he's an older prospect competing against some younger players. 
But then when you dive into some of the specifics, it's not that I'm saying that you have to look at this and say, like, this definitely does it, but it reduces my concern about some elements translating when you're talking about a guy who is really dominant in sort of this intermediate area. And one of the things I'll be doing in some articles coming out over the next month is kind of breaking down like where these receivers have specifically excelled. But with neighbors, these final two years, you've got that A dot of 11.5 and 11.6 respectively, right? And then after the catch, he's also an absolute monster. 625 yards after the catch last year, 291 yards after contact, and 31 evaded tackles. And when we're talking about the two players, and one of the things I always like to point out when we kind of go back to this element of, well, what is the like the biggest picture takeaway? And the biggest picture takeaway from Marvin Harrison is going to be a superstar. I'm not saying that if you have an area where you're like, you're so good that you don't even need it, that you're going to say, oh, well, this guy's possibly going to be a bust because he doesn't do this. But the after contact and the evasion metrics between the two players are dramatically different. And again, I think they're both going to be stars. But when you're looking at neighbors and you're looking at his ability with the ball in his hands, I think that just gives you another potential way to win. And one of the things we talk about from time to time with Debo Samuel is that there are elements where people are like, well, this part of his profile is not that great. This part, you know, we have some concerns. I mean, there are some stats that will tell you that Debo can't get open and doesn't catch passes very well. And you're like, well, I mean, I kind of beg to differ on some of those things, but also his ability with the ball is so elite that those things basically don't even matter. I don't think that we're talking about that type of a profile with neighbors per se, but what I feel for him is that those elements of his profile give him such a high floor. And then especially when we also have the, uh, confirmation of his athleticism where his pro day is just off the charts now one of the things is you'd love to see that you know at the combine with the rest of these guys when they're putting up the huge numbers but when we're talking about like four three five 42 inch vertical it seems like it's going to be hard to fudge your vertical right i mean this guy is going to be impossible to cover at the nfl level in a variety of different ways i don't have any problem putting him like at the edge of the top five dynasty receivers instantly. I think you made a, a really good case. Um, I'm going to make an, a case against Brian Thomas uh, eventually. And I think Keyshawn Butte is an interesting one as well because of how when you get into his per route stuff, he, he, his calling card is the, the the thing that lasted for him is that when he came in as a true freshman at LSU, he was very good. He earned volume right away, and he had this incredible true freshman season, which we know is super important. But he took a step back in his second season, um, and then he took a bigger step back in his third season. And then the NFL didn't really love him as a prospect, even though he was in early declare, and he he went later in the draft. And then, you know, you made those notes that the Patriots. Um, well, it wasn't a great spot to land for him, but he didn't make any impact there either. It, the, this this gets back to one of those, you know, the egg or getting the specific type things where, like, you can look at him and go, man, true freshman, like, breakout season elite. Like, this guy's a, a superstar. Well, one of the things that we do, like, if you can't build on that and you get worse every year, there you're, you're now pretty far away from those skills that you showed. And one of the reasons we like the early production is because you did it at a young age and it, it – tends to argue that you're just that good. We should then expect you as you get older <laughs> and you're getting more mature than the defenses players that you're going up against that you can dominate even more. You shouldn't be getting worse. You shouldn't be going backward in terms of your production. So anyway, uh, what's interesting about that as it relates to Brian Thomas and, and neighbors is those guys came in in 2021. And so there's also the argument that they were just sort of better than, than Butte or, or taking some of the production away from him. But when Thomas came in, he was not earning targets at uh, per route at an impressive rate at all. Um, but you mentioned this before. The route numbers are a little bit different from P PFF or, or Sports Info Solution. By by my numbers, 16% of routes he's earning a target on. Then in 2022, in Butte's final season, he's up to 18%. Uh, 
Uh, these are not good numbers, even at the NFL level, but for legit first round college prospects, they, they should be at 25%, essentially. I mean, they should be up there or plus. Uh, when I was talking about Marvin Harrison's two great years, 29.7%, then 32.4%. Neighbors that first year was at 21.4%, even in the crowded room. And then he gets up to 24% in his second year. These are the, this is before I was talking about the takeoff. He, then he takes off to 29.7%. He gets up into that Marvin Harrison range, All, almost 30% of his routes he's being targeted on. Brian Thomas, not even at 20%, is a pretty huge issue. And then after Butte leaves, it's neighbors who fills that whole vacuum last year and jumps up to 29.7%. Um, nearly 30% of his routes he's targeted on. Brian Thomas goes from 18% as a sophomore just up to 19.3% as a junior. He doesn't even have a single year in his college career where he hit 20% targets and his first two years that translates over to the yards per out run. Cause he wasn't efficient either last year, all of his yardage metrics explode his yards per out run look incredible because he had a 13.5 yards per target. His yards per team attempt looks incredible because he had 13.5 yards per target. He didn't earn volume, but he had a ton of big plays. He ends up with 17 touchdowns, which those plays happened and they matter. But part of the reason that targets per out run is so important to me is I believe what makes you an, a, an elite wide receiver, the reason that we see that athleticism doesn't necessarily show up as important at the wide receiver position is it's down to down consistency. Can you consistently do the technical things in your route? Do you understand your role in the offense? Do you understand defender leverage and what they're trying to accomplish so that you can constantly create separation and get open not just sometimes because the quarterback's not always going to be at you in his progression. When you, when you, you know, win on your route, you got to be open every single time he looks at you. Right. And then he'll throw to you the 30% of the time or, or every single time, whether he's looking at you or not. And then 30% of the time, maybe he's looking at you and you'll get the ball. And obviously nobody can be open every single time, but it is that consistency. How many plays can you win? Can you get open? Can you consistently be elite? Brian Thomas, very athletic, tons of big plays, tons of long touchdowns in a way that is very impressive, Sean, but doesn't display that down-to-down -down consistency of, of volume earning at any point in his college career. He doesn't display the efficiency either until his final year. And, and Sean, he has these long touchdowns. I, I was digging into it a little bit. He had touchdowns, uh, three touchdowns of 70 yards or longer, which is a – like a 70 yard TD is incredibly long to do to have three in one season is a lot. It winds up being about 20% of his total yardage for the year, just on those three plays. I, there are people that are scoffing right now and going, ah, this is, we've been told for years, this is the dumbest way to go about analysis. You can't just take out the player's biggest plays. I, I don't have the numbers in front of me. I'd venture to guess that there are probably no other receivers that had third, uh, three 70 plus yard touchdowns in all of college football. Obviously, there's a ton more teams in college football, but I say that from research I did on the NFL. No more receivers is probably unfair, but there's probably a handful at most. Uh, I, I did research on the NFL a few years back on uh, TDs of this length. They are exceedingly rare. To get multiple in the season is, is impressive at the NFL level, and they play more games. They run more routes. They see more targets. Um, to have three of them, and I'll tell you the teams they, they came against, Sean. They came against um, Army in a win, uh, a 62 to zero win. They came against, uh, another one came against Georgia state in a 56 to 14 win. And the third one came against Florida state in their opening week loss with a minute and 15 seconds left when they were down 45 to 17. It would be considered garbage time. And, and for most people that the defense was maybe not fully aware. They, they weren't trying to give up a 75 yard TD but they did when they were winning 45 to 17 with a minute left in the game. I'm not completely writing all that off, but that was 20% of his production. Those three plays alone. He has six TDs of, uh, of uh, 40 yards or more, nine TDs of 30 yards or more. So he has a bunch more in that 30 to, to 50 yard range. Um, and some of those came against some really good teams. He, again, 17 touchdowns. I'm only talking about three of them. And if he took those away, he still had 14 touchdowns, but it is a big chunk of his yards. And when we look at his yards per hour run, we look at his yards per team attempt and all of those things. When I break it down, I want to see somebody who earns targets per route and is efficient, not somebody who doesn't earn targets per route. And his efficiency 
is massive, is, is so otherworldly that I have to immediately say, yes, efficiency is, is important, but I, I want to regress this in some way. I, 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 and I'm the guy that wrote an article last year that said, if I never hear the term regression again, it'll be too soon. I hate that idea. We, Sean, talk all the time about you want guys who can be efficient. Ben, you're such a hypocrite. I am a huge hypocrite. But this is the type of efficiency that you look at it and you go, this is a red flag. It's too imbalanced for me. You can't have a yards per out run that's this strong and there's nothing on the targets per out run side and it's all on the yards per target side. And then I go dig into it and I go, oh, you had an 85-yard TD against Army in a game you won by 60. I want to know from you now that I've said all that because I'm getting uh, exceedingly low on Brian Thomas. And I think this also plays into why I'm very high on Malik Neighbors, but I'm not. It sounded to me like you were valuing the the competition as a key part of how dominant he was last year. He also has another first round receiver. I think the NFL is crazy for wanting Brian Thomas in the first round is where I'll go with it. I, I, I think he's a pretty clear fate right now in fantasy football. I need you to pull me back from the ledge so I don't have zero exposure to this guy and then then get slapped around. What If he can't even earn 20% of targets per route at the college level, and I know Neighbors is in the same offense, but especially after Butte is gone, you're talking about, I mean, two receivers in the same offense can both hit 20%. It's pretty easy. It happens a lot. It happens at the NFL level. And especially at college where things can be concentrated. Help me understand why Brian Thomas is not just a few extra splashy touchdowns. Because the other concern I have there, I'll just note, with it, how athletic he is and how good Jaden Daniels is, and we know that he's a, his ability to extend plays, you're talking about, well, was he just a really good fit for a quarterback who extended plays and then chucked these deep passes, and then this really athletic receiver got free downfield because he had extra time because his quarterback was able to extend the play. What am I missing? Well, I think there are a variety of ways to be enthusiastic. So much of Blair's research over the past several years has pointed at this idea of a lot of the advanced stats have, and this, you know, and maybe this won't be exactly the right terminology, but it's essentially jumped the shark. And that when people are selling big yardage plays, when they're selling touchdowns, you know, you were talking about you know, there's no stat that answers all the questions. And the one that's actually closest is just fantasy points, <laughs> right? And so we can we can go back to some elements of that. And then we're talking about a player who is still a younger player. It's not somebody who did this like in his fifth season. We're talking about a guy who's 6'3", 209, who runs a 4'3", has a 38 and a half inch vertical. Now, when you pull up some of his most successful physical comps, you know, it kind of leans almost back into that direction of, you know, maybe this makes me nervous. Because, I mean, some of the guys who pop here are DJ Chart, Christian Watson, Martavis Bryant. I mean, you could be forgiven for not actually wanting those guys as a top 15 pick in the NFL draft. So I think especially when you have a player like Neighbors, who is just so utterly dominant, when you're able to fill your profile out, by accomplishing some of these other things. And then certainly if the NFL is going to draft you in a range where you're going to get a lot of chances. Now, again, I said at the very beginning of the show, your draft slot will not protect you if you can't actually play receiver at the NFL level, but you're going to at least get a good shot. Kind of following up on what you were saying, though, I do think that there is a lot of room to at least put Brian Thomas more in that like number seven or eight range, as opposed to number four. One of the things, it's just, I don't want people to overstate the value of some of these elements, but it's kind of fun to chop up some of their different results. And so when I'm looking at targets with air yards of between six and 20, so still a pretty wide group, but we're taking out these screen passes, we're taking out, you know, little basically handoffs behind the line of scrimmage, and we're taking out these plays where you're just getting over the top for these long touchdowns like you're talking about. In that range, Malik Neighbors out-targeted Brian Thomas 61 to 27, right? He had a better on-target catch percentage, dramatically so, despite the fact that within that group, their ADOTs, because we've kind of already solved for that, their ADOTs are about the same. And then the other element there is that 
with the ball then in his hands, we're talking about, and again, neighbors has more than twice as many targets, so he's going to have a lot more chances, but he's got 17 evaded tackles and Brian Thomas just has three. So I think if, if you know, our basic premise is there is still a, a very large gap between these two players. And I don't think that people are necessarily pushing back on that. It's just that, again, when you're trading back in the NFL draft and maybe you're thinking, okay, we could take Malik neighbor six, or we could move back and take Brian Thomas 12. I mean, you better get an absolute ton to move back from one spot to the other, because these two players are not similar. And you put it very well there when you said there's room to rank him like wide receiver seven or eight. I should be clear and say that I'm saying this in the context of on underdog, his ADP is like not far behind a Dunze's because of the expected draft capital. He looks like the clear wide receiver four at an average pick overall grading the mocks at right around pick 20. And then everyone else is like back at like 27 plus. I, I mentioned how everyone's sort of jammed together in that range, but he's, a handful plus picks ahead of the rest of the the group. I did some like light rankings as I was doing all this research. And I, I put Brian Thomas at wide receiver six. So I want to be clear that I didn't actually drop him to like wide receiver 20. I, it's exactly what you said is the way that I, is where I felt. I agree with you that the efficiency still matters. The ability to play off an elite player still matters. I think, you know, he could be a high efficiency number two at the NFL level. That's still good. Like that's still a positive. If he can be that kind of player, my concern is, I mean, I agree with you. Also, I would, I would classify myself as completely agreeing with your point that Blair made about some of the uh, advanced stats of jumping the shark. I will say that I would still want to see a targets per run over 20% at some point, right? Like that's, I, I don't think that one is jumping the shark. I think you have to earn volume. And so that's why I don't think this guy can be an alpha dominant number one wide receiver. And if you're taking a rookie in early best ball drafts at pick 65 or whatever it is, you want to think that this guy has the potential to be a pretty dominant target earner early in his career. And so that it's all price adjusted. As I say, all this stuff, there are two guys that are projected to go later than him and are going much later than him in the early best ball drafts and are presumably going to go later than him because of draft capital and everything else in most rookie drafts that I would rank higher. And thus by putting him at wide receiver six, that's where I I'm like, I, I probably won't get much of him. Like, and, and I don't, I don't like not having any of a hyper athletic uh, rookie wide receiver that people are really in on. And as a first rounder, you know, I want to have some exposure to all of those types of guys. So that's where I was saying kind of save me is like, it's not that I'm ranking him as wide receiver 15, but if I put him at wide receiver six, I'm probably not going to draft him in any format, right? I mean, it's just a, a reality of the ways that we play this game. Unless I start to take him over some of the other guys that I have ranked ahead of him, one of those guys, Sean, is one of the Texas receivers that we were talking about earlier. And I think those guys are really, really interesting. And it's something that I would like to get your thoughts on as well, because we have these two receivers, Xavier Worthy and A.D. Mitchell, who are both projected to go in the first round, late part of the first round. They played together last year. Prior to that, Mitchell was with Georgia for a couple of seasons and then transferred to Texas. This is one of those transfers, like we talked about, where I'm – not really like writing it off as a bad thing. I mean, he was playing at Georgia. He just seemed to want to go to Texas. Maybe he was getting a lot of NIL money, what have you. Um, Wanted an opportunity to showcase different skills. I don't know, whatever it may be. But what's really interesting about their profiles is how they intersect, inter inter, uh, weave as Mitchell comes over. Worthy in his first two seasons is the deep threat in Texas. Um, Really high A dot. His sophomore year earns volume at an insane rate yards, uh, excuse me, targets per route at a really high a dot. I mentioned that stat weighted targets per route run where I incorporate uh, essentially air yards per route run and and a a depth of target element. Uh, Worthy's sophomore season is tied with Harrison's best year as the best single season weighted targets per out run that you'll find for the guys that we're going to talk about today. I haven't dug into every wide receiver at some of the smaller schools and things like that, but um, and I mentioned Malik neighbors in his third year, 
took off. He took off to a weighted targets per run of 0.80. Marvin Harrison's top two years were 0.85 and 0.89. The 0.80 was still very, very strong. Um, but that's where Xavier Worthy's second season was, was way up at 0.89. I mean, it was an absurd amount of volume, but his yards per target was 6.7. I mean, it was horrible. We talked about the Quinn Ewer stuff. He was a, a, a true freshman, and, or maybe it wasn't true freshman. I don't know his whole story, but it was his first year starting, and he wasn't very good. Worthy was more efficient as a true freshman, earning less volume, and then also last year. And so his yards per route run, despite these massive targets per route run numbers, in his second season, that was his career low in yards per route run because the efficiency was so, so bad. And the efficiency stuff matters. But what's interesting is in year three, when Mitchell comes over, who had mostly played a deep threat role while at Georgia, Mitchell takes the high A dot stuff. Worthy's A dot comes down to 10.3, which is slightly below average. And suddenly he's a lot more efficient on that. He still earns a lot of volume. His target spot run actually comes down, which is a little bit of a concern because he was earning all this volume at a high a dot uh typically it's harder to earn the volume at a high a dot and so now at a lower a dot he's earning less volume that's a little weird but he has more competition mitchell comes over and is earning fewer targets per route than he was while at georgia as he's a year older he's down two percentage points in targets per route run from his time in georgia two and a half target uh percentage points and so that's a concern as well. He is in a high eight out role, but he was in a high eight out role in Georgia as well. He's a little more efficient. He winds up with his best yards per out run. But Mitchell, to me, is a really tough one. He's another guy that's going very high. If you just look at his volume earning, a lot of the concerns I just said with Brian Thomas, you look at his efficiency, you look at his yards per out run, he doesn't really have a season anywhere that says this guy is worth a first round pick statistically. Um and then meanwhile, Worthy does. He has three straight years with targets per out run of, of 25% or higher. The peak was 28.5%. I just mentioned that was at a high dot that gave you this really strong weighted targets per out run. This guy earned volume all three years in college, different quarterbacks, different roles, downfield, then underneath more. Wasn't always hyper efficient for a guy who's as fast as he is. But this is not a, your typical speedster. He went, he went, um, Ran the 40 at 4.21. That's the guy we're talking about. Broke John Ross's combine record. And I think for a lot of people, the alarm bell goes off and says, every time we hear about these really fast guys, they're not good. Xavier Worthy is not that. This is a dude that earns volume per route. This is a dude that had a profile that made him interesting before he ran a 4.21. He didn't need the 4.21 to get interesting. How do you think through these two guys and the way that Mitchell coming over pushed Worthy into a different role. I think there's two different ways to look at that. Is it because he wasn't successful in a vertical role, wasn't efficient? Or is it because Texas was like, look, our quarterback can't throw those balls. We need to get you into a spot where we can get the ball in your hands. We want the ball in your hands. You're the better receiver. And I think when you look at the fact that Mitchell didn't really earn a lot of volume downfield and wasn't particularly great in the downfield role, that that would lend some credence to that second argument. Um it's an interesting eval of these two Texas receivers that have projected draft capital nearly neck and neck in the, in the back half of the first round. And I mean, that's a, a great setup for this question of like, who's actually number three. And one of the reasons you mean four, no, <laughs> you, you mean four, Sean, Sean, don't do this to me. You mean four. I, I know that Ben is is desperately wanting his Husky to be locked in in a tier above. But Xavier Worthy, Ben, I, I, he's got a real shot to be a superstar. I think that in some ways a higher floor and a higher ceiling than a doomsday. I say a higher floor simply because I think there's less chance that he's actually a bust. Um, a doomsday, if they're both straightforwardly good NFL players, I think perhaps has a chance to to score in fantasy a little bit better. Higher median, but, if you will. Yeah. But Worthy also has this potential kind of Tyreek Hill element to him, even though they're different guys, right? But when you look at what he did, and so the Quinn Ewers deal is, is kind of weird in that he was at Ohio State the, 
the year before he plays at Texas. My understanding there is he never actually planned to play at Ohio State, but there were some NIL things that he could do. But he was looking to start in Texas in 2022 and did. The numbers are not great for him. I mean, this is a guy who had some talent around him and completes less than 60% of his passes and throws 15 touchdowns in 2022. When you're talking about a team that the next year is in the college football semifinals, and even then, the numbers are maybe not as good as you would expect from a touchdown perspective, right? But there probably are some things that limit Worthy a little bit there. There's also an element that Travis was talking about on OT where Worthy played a pretty decent chunk of this time with an injured hand. And so he can't catch. And one of the things that you're looking at in that 22 campaign where you mentioned that some of the peripherals are amazing, but the yards per target is tragic, is he's got almost a 14% drop rate. And I guess I'm thinking that that is a fluke. Although, again, anybody who is fast and drops the ball a lot, there's going to be some risk there, right? That's what I want to look at. That's We just make the Will Fuller comp at this point, right? <laughs> this is the part of the show. Well, I mean, Will Fuller is somebody I would I would draft if he would go out and play on an NFL team. Uh, <laughs> Still to, in 2024. But the overall trajectory there, the years two and three are not as dynamic as you would expect, but the freshman year is one of the greatest freshman seasons ever. And especially when we're talking about small guys, you want that early production and you want the elite speed. We're a little more scared of these big guys like Xavier Leggett, who is a freakish athlete, but comes on very late. And when you're talking about post-draft, putting together projections, uh, you know, doing a regression, finding how things work and speed popping up as a negative, which is a bizarre thing to have happen, but is something that results from the athletic receivers being so overdrafted by the NFL decision makers, we're really worried more about the big guys. And it's not to say that it can't be a concern either way, but you want the small players to emerge early and you need them to be fast because not being big is still a problem. It's less of a problem now. And that's one of the things that we're seeing in the contemporary NFL offenses. So I think especially when you're talking about how NFL teams do things now, and you're talking about a player who is going to be the most athletic player on every single field he ever steps on as a professional player, that that element perhaps gives you less of a concern than you get from someone like a Dunze, where certainly not all, I think it's overstated in some quarters, like how much of his profile relies on that fourth year. And I go back to some of the statements from the beginning of the show where especially when you're coming in and your freshman year is you know is marred by pandemic and some things like that i think you have to look at the trajectory differently than for players who didn't have that as part of their collegiate experience but when we compare the two players and we look at how they might fit in nfl offenses i do come back to this element where i just i think that worthy is that good and the in a different year where you don't have these two kind of epic <laughs> wide receiver one, wide receiver two talents, there'd be even more enthusiasm for him. And it's interesting to me because with all of the, I think that people think that he's just fast and that the statistical profile does not back that up. And for the reasons that you mentioned, I mean, again, this is a guy who in 12 games as a freshman, goes for 981 yards, 12 touchdowns. He only has 337 routes that year based on the way SIS does it. He's got a 39% dominator. I mean, this is a true freshman. And it's one of the greatest freshman seasons ever. The idea that he didn't really back that up in years two and three, probably not as true as it seems on the surface. I'm not saying that you should ignore those seasons. But, I mean, this is the guy in the right offense. And, I guess I'm a little bit surprised. I, I think he's going to go much earlier than people think. I think he's going to go in the top 20. But certainly if he falls into the range where you're actually talking about him being drafted onto an elite team, a team that already has most of the things they need in place, then again, I mean, maybe he gets drafted onto a team that has a number one. But I think, again, the floor then ends up being extremely high. The chance that he busts, I think, is is negligible. I think that's a, a good way of putting it. Um, you, you have to be really high on Xavier Worthy. He's, I put him at wide receiver four. I, I think he's, 
pretty clearly uh, for all the for me for all the concerns I said about Brian Thomas, pretty clearly the wide receiver four, or you're making the case of wide receiver three. But to me, it's almost like there's a tier break after him, not after a Dunze. Um, you said the 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 second and third year some of the overall production not necessarily as great or per route or however you want to look at that. And yet we don't want to necessarily just look at that as like falling off. And I, I, I mean, I, that was sort of the point I was trying to make that second year is when the, when the volume was crazy and last year in a different role to still be over 25% targets per out run. I mean, even if the, the second year with the massive volume was his only real inefficient year. He's pretty efficient in his first and third year. The volume earning isn't quite as high those years, but it's still very strong. If you look at the whole profile, the efficiency over the three years is pretty good. The volume earning is established over three different years as being almost elite, especially when you consider that it's like sort of a different depths and in different roles and, again, different quarterbacks. Yeah, I mean, I'm right there with you. This is a really intriguing profile, and that's before you talk about, oh, yeah, he ran a 4.21, and teams are going to probably bump him up their boards. And I mean, he very well might go before Brian Thomas after, you know, as, as strong as he, of a combine as that, that gave him. Um, the Adunze point, I get it on paper, Sean, but you just don't know ball and haven't watched enough Washington Huskies. So unfortunately, Man, I, put so <laughs> many, I put so many positive notes <laughs> in the rookie guide about a dude say to make sure people didn't simply look at years two and three and the, and the yards per team attempt and say, this guy is the big bust risk because there are so many positives to his game before we talk about that, or if we kind of, Skate by it because we both agree that that uh, dude's yeah. an excellent prospect as well. The the Mitchell thing I think is interesting, and we're talking about Worthy and the competition there. Jatavian Sanders at tight end, also I think better than people realize. He's somebody I'm going to be trying to target a lot. One of the reasons that you and I continue to try and acquire second round picks in the drafts that we're doing. But when you Sean look- says Sean says one of the reasons that we do that is if that was our strategy together. Uh, this is the first I'm hearing that we're targeting Jatavia on Sanders, but I'm excited about it. It sounds great. <laughs> I, I appreciate that you have my back on on, us, on targeting these uh, these picks. We did make a great trade to uh, to move Mike Evans recently and pick up a, a second, a late round move back and a future second, which I felt like was really good value. So good work on that. <laughs> yeah, we'll see it <laughs> when when Evans goes for 15 and right 1515. The guy. <laughs> Who got it for two second round picks is going to be like, I don't know if those guys have played fantasy football before. Right. And and one of the second round picks this year's was like 211. So to be clear, we could definitely lose this trade. We just have a lot of receiver depth, a lot of young receiver depth. Uh, cashing in on Evans now makes sense for where our roster is. And so when you're looking at Mitchell, you're talking about a guy who is a Georgia recruit in 2021, comes in, immediately runs more routes, generates more targets, and creates more air yards than Ladd McConkey and Jermaine Burton. And I think that's relevant because obviously McConkey is very trendy. I actually think Jermaine Burton, while probably a guy who ends up being just sort of a role player at the NFL level, I think he's still a, a pretty good prospect. You know, if you're thinking about the contract that Josh Reynolds just signed, for example, you know, if you can draft Jermaine Burton in the middle of the draft, and, you know, we'll see where he goes, but that might be just as easy, if not a better way to address some of those types of things. Then he has injuries in 2022. He goes to Texas in 2023, as you mentioned. And the on-target catch percentage, extremely high, despite or in concert with the A dot around 15. You, know, you have the, the team leading 11 touchdowns. There are so many pieces there that also point to him. And he's somebody that I actually thought I was going to be maybe a little bit higher than other people on him and then that's really not the case because he is being projected in many cases in the first round but i mean this is a player who again you're talking about 6'2 205 the 434 and then on top of that you have a 98th percentile explosion score and so for me as i'm kind of working through it and it depends on how many drafts you're doing but 
you probably don't want to end up with zero Brian Thomas. Although if you just have him on a few teams, those teams do well. Every other team does poorly. You're going to be lamenting that as well. But there is, depending on how far apart these guys go in the reality draft, but there's a potentially very straightforward arbitrage play here to where at this point, I guess I would be surprised if Mitchell isn't the better prospect. And there are going to be some formats in which you're getting very different prices on these two players. I think that right now, as we record today, he would be my preference above Brian Thomas as well. That's very interesting because I don't like the Mitchell profile. And I thought what you were going to say is you didn't want to have zero um, Thomas, but you would be comfortable having zero Mitchell, basically, is where, is where I thought you were going to go with that. Um, you're right about the prices. Thomas right now, 64.3 ADP on underdog. Mitchell is at all the way back at 97.4, about 30 picks later, in, more than 30 picks later in, in early um, – best ball drafts that's not the only format obviously but, but that is still a, an aggressive price in its own right it is aggressive it does feel aggressive but as far as opportunity costs pick 100 pick 65 we know are, are are significantly different um especially at like those onesie positions and stuff like that the qb you're going to get at 65 versus 100 the tight end those are going to be pretty big differences typically um i haven't been drafting it enough to to really give some great examples there but um yeah no i think that's an interesting take because i i I, I guess I would go the, the other direction with it. I, I did Mitchell pretty low when I did my rankings. I moved Thomas on to wide receiver six. I would have moved Mitchell down to, let's see, seven, eight. I guess I only have my wide receiver nine, so I'm not like dropping him out of you know the world or anything. But the the efficiency that Thomas gave us, the the, the 17 TDs, the, the number of huge plays, I think is necessary when you're not a huge target earner. Mitchell looks like that's a concern, but didn't necessarily give that monster efficiency where I can then tell myself that he's incredible and good efficiency. But but it's interesting. I, I think you made a good case. I'm, I'm going to definitely go back and look at Mitchell some more. Sean, I mentioned Worthy at four and moving Thomas to six. For me, the guy in between there is actually 10th in expected draft value. And for anyone who thinks... Um, I'm a pure homer with all this Roma Dunze love. It is not another Husky. It is going to be Lad, Lad McConkey. It's in, in fact an Oregon duck that I have to mention. Uh, Troy Franklin's profile is pretty straightforwardly strong. I don't like you, you mentioned in the rookie guide in your write up that his uh, athletic testing made him a really good comp for Robbie Anderson or Robbie Chosen now, which that's the big concern is that he is very small he's very uh slender but he's a three-year early declare his first year he earned volume at a solid rate per route not very efficient after the target second year the volume earning doesn't really explode the efficiency gets a lot better and then the third year so his yards per out run jumps like almost a full yard and then the third year his uh volume explodes and his yards per target bumps and so his yards per out run jumps almost another yard, full yard again. And so you have this progression to really strong target earning late in his career and, and year three. You mentioned this with neighbors and with Xavier Worthy. We're talking about early declares differently. When 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 this guy is doing this in his final season, but it's his third college you know eligible season, that's different than, you know, for example, with the Dunes, one of the minor things is that he did stay four years. Part of that's because the Huskies only played four, year, uh, four games in the pandemic season. Part of that's because the whole Husky team came back and tried to make a run a national title. You're going to see a bunch of Huskies drafted in the first two days, both of their offensive tackles, their quarterback. They had two tight ends that went to the combine, potentially all three of their wide receivers. Basically their whole offense was guys that came back. He would have basically been the one defector if he went pro. Um, so I'll just throw that little note in, in defense of a Dunze, although he did need that final season, I think to be talked about as a top 10 player, because it was his best season and, and significantly. So as you mentioned, but Franklin, three-year player, and his third season is incredible. What, like, I, I guess my question for you on Franklin, we know about the value of early declare. We know about the value of all these efficiency metrics. He's he's strong. I mean, he has a, a great third season as an early declare. What are what are the red flags? What are the concerns here? Why is he tenth? 
I would like to see him pop even more in just some of the overall metrics early. And I would like to see just a, an even slightly cleaner physical profile in, in terms of a, I, I think you do have some risk when you're talking about a guy who is of his stature. And then secondly, you know, his athletic marks were kind of all over the place. He has this really poor 10 yard split. One of the things, you know, talking with Travis, he talks about him being a little bit of a, a build speed guy, but then, you know, once it's there, it's there. And that, you know, his on field speeds, like verified times in college, you know, when he gets some of those breakaway plays. And again, I mean, that's kind of always the crux of the matter when you're talking about these times. Like you're going to see these times on 60 yard runs, right? Because the guy was able to get up to the full speed. And the question is, you know, how many of those plays are there going to be at the NFL level? And the answer, as you mentioned before, is that there aren't going to be that many, and yet it doesn't necessarily take that many for it to help you in that particular fantasy game or to help it, his team. You know, you have to add a couple of long touchdowns, you know, on the season. Say, if those two long touchdowns make the difference in winning those two games, I mean, that completely changes your season around. So I don't. I'm not saying it doesn't matter. I'm saying that. I mean, this is the kind of player that I love, and I'm just trying not to get sort of too far out in front on it, especially in, in that, you know, there were some very mild drop concerns in the final year. But I mean, this is another player where I don't think that you have to have the same questions that you might have, you know, thinking back to some of the things that the Oregon offense does and how it gets the ball to receivers underneath. When you break down, you know, where he is in that sort of six to 20 range, he's got a lot of targets. Right. And so it's not a matter of a Jalen Hyatt where you're getting all of this. You know, even with what I just mentioned there about the long scores and you know, how you're kind of judging the athleticism there, it's not the Jalen Hyatt type of thing. It's not something where, you know, all of these targets are right next to the line of scrimmage. The overall 2023 profile is very, very strong. And so, especially when that profile comes in year three as opposed to in year four. I like him. I think he's undervalued and he's not necessarily a guy who is being projected in the first round right now. In most of the mocks that I'm seeing, he is very clearly better than two to three of the guys who are. Yeah. But I think you made some really good points there as well about some of the concerns and some of the stuff that I was missing. I mean, you mentioned some of the raw numbers. He wasn't even, didn't even run very many routes as a true freshman only had 209 yards. I'm looking at it from the per route basis, but um, his sophomore season, 891 yards is good, but, uh, I mentioned the, the efficiency kind of exploded. there, not really big volume earning and not getting a ton of routes. And then last year the routes do hit a, a career high, but still not crazy. Um, but his efficiency was really strong as well. He has the, the, the huge raw numbers. He gets up to almost 1400 yards last year, but it really was an, an outlier season, I guess, compared to his other two years. And so you would have liked to see some of that a little earlier. The the stuff you talked about with his weight, certainly a little concerning. A name you mentioned earlier as well that I really want to talk about is Xavier Leggett, who when we talk about these profiles and we're talking about the early declares and all those things. I loved reading your notes on him. And I'm going to just give another pitch for the, the road of his rookie guide. Cause I'm not going to do this much research on running backs. We're not going to talk about all of Sean's notes on the running backs. Sean wrote all these notes on quarterbacks, running backs, wide receivers, and tight ends. So I've mentioned some of the stuff from the wide receivers, but don't think for a second that you're getting all the help you could get. If you didn't go buy that thing, Xavier Leggett, you mentioned came out of high school with an athlete designation. And so he wasn't necessarily even going to play wide receiver he runs 190 routes as a true freshman in 2019. That winds up being his highest number of routes until last year, which is fit, which is his fifth season in college. The 190 routes are very poor. The yards per target is poor. The whole profile is not good as a true freshman. He only runs 98 in 2020. That's the pandemic year. He runs between 100 and 150 in 2021 and 2022. These are going to be slightly different then. Um, the sports info solution members, as, as we've talked about, 
He's at a really low A dot those two years, sub 10. The first two years he had been higher than 10. And his final season, he also gets all the way up to 13.8, which is a really high vertical A dot, which we would expect because the, the deal with Xavier Leggett is this guy's big, hyper fast. Uh, I want you to talk more about the, the physical profile, but like the comp I made in my head, which isn't necessarily fair to this player because he had, I think, a better profile as a as a prospect, certainly wasn't a five-year guy in college was DK Metcalf where it was like, yeah, we didn't really love his analytical profile, but like he he's DK Metcalf. This guy's just different athletically. That's the impression I get with Xavier Leggett is he is different athletically. Um, but the concern is those first four years, he runs about a full season's worth of routes if you add them all up and there's no production and all the per route stuff is bad. There's some different roles in there. Like I mentioned, the, the, 2021 and 2022 years, they, they've got him down at this lower A dot. It seems like they're just trying to get the ball into his hand, maybe use his athleticism. Doesn't really pan out with any production. He doesn't have more than 200 receiving yards in any of those four years, which, again, we we're just talking about how it's good to have, you know, a three year college career and production and then go pro. Four years is typically <laughs> the, the, the deal, right? He gets a fifth year in part because of the COVID stuff, but he goes out last year. And he runs almost 400 routes, ton more than any other season in his career. His ADOT is way up at 13.8. He earns targets on 24.4% of, uh, of routes. I mentioned earlier in this long show that um, we were we would hope for college players to be at least around like 25%. Some of the concerns I had for like a Brian Thomas, he never had a season over 20%. Like gets all the way up at 24.4%. So for a raw receiver that needed time to develop, that's a big number for me at the 13.8 a dot, which gives him a weighted targets per out run of 0.69, which is very strong, very not, it's not elite, but it's very strong shows an ability to earn volume also shows the efficiency. So he has the 12.9 yards per target as well. Yards per out run up over three. It's a really impressive year in its own right. But the reason I preempted all of that by talking about the four years where he did absolutely nothing is this is a red flag profile. Typically when you see no production over four years, and then it takes until he's a lot more developed than his opponents, and he's a fifth-year player and he's older to actually produce at the college level. Having said that, you have long told me, and you've long told the, the Stealing Bananas listeners, that if we are going to look for these late breakout guys or these non-early declares with the late production and they're you know, a lot of times the fourth-year production and that's all they have, they better have some kind of athletic trait that's defining. They better be... There better be something unique about them. It's a Chase Claypool profile. Claypool has, you know, it, it's not until his fourth year that he really breaks out, but he's hyper athletic. And that's, you know, I know you wrote about him um, that year as a, a an intriguing sleeper rookie. And obviously we got some great early production in, in, in the pros. And then I would argue more kind of off field stuff with Claypool that probably derailed his career a little bit. Back to Leggett. I think I'm pretty in on this dude, Sean. And I think the reason is what you wrote about the athlete profile, the lack of overall routes, which kind of follows the narrative that he needed seasoning. He needed to learn the position, the really poor production in his true freshman year when they throw him out there for 190 routes and then how they scale that back. They try some different roles, lower a dot. And then finally last year, it all kind of comes together and he has a line that looks like what he should have for a big athletic receiver, a high A dot, and he earns volume at that level anyway. It is in, when he's later in his career, but one of the big issues with these these truly athletic players is when they never show the ability to produce at all at the college level. Then you're like, okay, well, you had that athleticism. How could you not manifest that into some production in college? Why, why would I bet on you to then suddenly do it in the pros? At least Leggett gives us this season where he takes that athleticism and turns it into production. It's a it's a non-traditional profile, but seeing that he can translate his physical features into big numbers gets me intrigued by him, at least as a later round guy. It does. It, it also just, I mean, this one, I think is going to, I mean, it always depends on the quality of the team that gets him. But, you know, maybe a team like the Kansas City Chiefs could make something out of it. Although, mostly they fail to, to do that, right? I mean, Rasheed Rice stands out because he's actually been good. And most of their other attempts at this have failed. It was interesting in talking with Travis because as a big college football guy, he was kind of pointing out this element of, like, he actually wouldn't have gotten the routes his final year either 
if not for teammate injuries, which I oh. thought was really interesting. Because I mean, the thing you're noting there is just like, I mean, you're not pushing your way onto the field. And NFL prospects, borderline first-round picks, I mean, that kind of thing should just stand out as being like the, the easiest first step that you do. I mean, And I guess when you're this big... lack of volume through four years is mind-blowing. And when you're this big and you're this fast, the coaches are probably looking for a reason. Like you don't even need to stand out. They're just like, you already stand out by standing on the sideline. They probably want, want a reason to get him on the field. So it's almost yeah. even more concerning. I mean, you're talking about a 221 pound receiver who ran a four, three, nine, who has an 85th percentile explosion. The guys who pop in our workout explorer, you know, for that kind of the high end guys, I mean, you're talking about Andre Johnson, Javon Walker, um, uh, the, the problem is, I mean, he's not going to be Andre Johnson. I mean, we know that <laughs> that dude was like miles and miles ahead of what we're talking about with Xavier Leggett. And the rest of the names, you get names similar to the, the players that you were mentioning, right? Where Dante Montcrief, uh, Derek Rogers is one of those names from, you know, back about 10 years ago where everybody was excited about him for some of these, you know, vaguely similar-ish reasons. I know, I mean, John Moore wrote a ton about Charles Johnson around that time frame. I mean, relatively young and, and new people to the space probably won't even know that name, but that's someone who was, you know, productive at a smaller school down the stretch, big, super athletic. You, know, you have some other ended up being here, like... a, ended up being a star in the XFL. Sean Charles Johnson had a great year for, uh, I believe the Orlando, uh, I don't know, guardians. I want to say it was. Yeah. So, I mean, he, he maybe could still play. I don't know. There you go. There you go. But some of these other names, you know, a Sammy Coates, you know, that's one where, again, there was reason to be He was bad in the XFL. <laughs> he couldn't even produce in the XFL. You have a guy that I really thought was going to be different than what it turned out in Jalen Strong. You have a Jeff Janis, who obviously, um, I mean, is Jeff Janis still Davis's favorite player? Probably. Yeah, I would, I would guess. So... I, just because you have this athletic profile doesn't mean you're going to succeed. And and we know that, but it's easier to know that and be like, after the fact, like, Oh, we all knew he wasn't going to succeed. He wasn't good. And just being athletic doesn't matter. Whereas during the prospect season, you're like, look at what this dude just did. And I mean, he's amazingly athletic and he's going to get drafted, you know, borderline first round. You can't afford to be out on that. The, the thing there with the borderline first round is tricky for me because on the one hand, the draft slot will get him enough opportunities that we'll get to see if he can play or not. And that is something that helps. But the flip side of it for price and fantasy means that once someone that athletic is drafted in that range, you know, can we get prices that remove all of our concerns about the risk that comes with this player who didn't do anything through four years? And so I guess for me, that's the issue is are, are we going to – ever get prices to where it makes sense to take some shots on this player because i mean I, i'd love for it to work out i mean one of the things here is that you know he did generate 457 yards after the catch you know how much of that is you know simply being over the top that you love for a player who's that big and that athletic to also have huge numbers for yards after contact but that's not really the case the evasion numbers don't really stand out I mean, heard some conflicting things in terms of what people think like the play strength is there. This one is one where I just don't think there's any way to portray it other than a lot of reward, a lot of risk. And I, I think if you're overly confident on what Xavier Leggett is, then you're probably just overly confident. Yeah. I When you said Dante Moncrief, that's when my excitement was like, all right, it's it's quelled. I'm, I'm back to uh, the... the the comfortable middle ground where um, he could be interesting in the right landing spot. I think you put that very well as well. Um, part of my excitement, I was thinking about the Metcalf stuff and just thinking back to when the Seahawks got him, he fell a little bit in the draft and now, you know, Pete Carroll takes his shirt off. They're so excited to get him. And I felt like early in his career, they just, you know, everyone was always talking about DK Metcalf's route tree and he can only run the vertical and like a slant or something. Like he can only run like two routes, but he's still getting like force fed targets. Cause they're like the Seahawks were like, we drafted this dude because he's really big and fast and we're going to throw him the football because that's what we like. 
my thought was sort of on that li- you know line of thinking where like whoever ends up taking this guy is going to say the athletic traits matter to us. We think he's a scheme mismatch. We want to get him on the field and get him in position to make plays. Um, we'll see. The 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 draft capital will matter. The landing spot will matter. He's definitely going to need some help. When you look at this profile, it's not somebody who is just – it's it's very, very far from somebody who's just lighting up college football every year in his college career. This is a guy who did, again, very, very little for four straight years. And then as a fifth-year player, your other note uh, from Travis that maybe wouldn't even have played as a fifth-year player, but then some teammate injuries get him on the field and, and has a great season. And now with the athleticism, we're, we're talking about him you know, in, in day – one day two of the draft so that's that's a fascinating little butterfly effect there as well um who else? so the only other name well there's a couple more names i guess that we haven't mentioned that were that are currently uh over at grand the mocks currently projected in the in the top 10 wide receivers the last two are um lad mcconkey who we've mentioned a couple times but not really talked about and keon coleman Coleman's another one of those guys. He was a transfer and another one of those guys where for me, the the per route run volume, it's okay, but it's just not good enough. And then there's not really a lot of after the target efficiency either in the profile. And you wrote in, in the guide a little bit about how his teammate, Johnny Wilson was a lot better. And I said to you before the show, I was trying to figure it out. Why is Coleman going way ahead of Wilson? Because Wilson, you also noted, is like 6'6". He's like a monster and and ran a pretty good 40 time. I've heard there's some talk about him moving to tight end maybe. What's the deal with Coleman and Wilson, the two Florida State guys? Yeah, I think that's that's the question. And that's one that we're going to have to continue to sort of explore as we get a little bit deeper into this process the, I mean, the number one thing that jumps out here to me, Ben, is that like both of these guys really struggled to catch the ball. And I think that that is a little bit of an issue. You mentioned Johnny Wilson and, you know, how big he is. I mean, he ties for the best freak score in the class. I mean, this is somebody who at 6'6", 231, runs a 4'5", I think that there are a lot of concerns about what the positional fit would be. Because you're like, I mean, this is too big to be what we really are looking for from wide receivers in 2024. I mean, Devin Funchess comes up as one of his physical comps. And there are reasons to be both excited and concerned for him, obviously. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, in the end, in part because of injuries, I think it doesn't exactly pan out. But, I mean, when you talk about the per route value for Wilson along with this crazy, you know, size athleticism profile, it is something where you're like, man, if we could get that into the tight end position and get the premium and all of that. And yet, I mean, at 231 being a receiver, I mean, is it anything more than just like manipulating what the the listing is? I mean, could he do any real tight end things? I mean, those things are are tricky. I, I think that for me, it's more this question of, I mean, you you watch the combine. You want to get really excited about all the positives. <laughs> One of the things that, simply because Puka was so good last year, people want to really emphasize like how he looked in the gauntlet. Which, I mean, this is a non NFL. <laughs> no one's out there running gauntlets right. when you're trying to to gain yards. That was the area of the combine where Coleman looked good, and otherwise, I mean, his results are disappointing. His results as a in the final year too, there at Florida State are disappointing, right? I mean, you've got an 85% on target catch percentage. You're averaging like 55 yards per game. You're a full yard per route below Johnny Wilson. I mean, this is one where this seems to be the guy who is elevated because of scouting enthusiasm. And, and we do tend to see those players. Yeah. On the other hand, and this is still a prospect profile that I'm struggling to to figure out even after the fact. I mean, he was more successful the previous year at Michigan State than Jaden Reed, who, I mean, Jaden Reed had been good at Michigan State, but had a down final season. It's like, you know, how do we put that together? But partly it's the things like neither one of those guys were actually all that great at Michigan State. They had a tough year. Yeah. So 
if you want to make a case for Coleman, you can, but in a first round pick, I would want a guy who's either more clearly athletic because he runs a four, six, one. I mean, this isn't a guy who at a big size, you know, also ran in the four threes. Although again, for the big guys, that's that straight line speed can be overrated or you just, I mean, you just want to have more production. This is not enough production for a first round pick to feel like you're not taking a big risk by drafting him as opposed to drafting some of the guys who are cheap. Yeah. I mean, I think that makes a lot of sense. I just, I, I think you put it well with the kind of being boosted by some of the scouting stuff or, I mean, it, it, it's hard to look at his pro his, statistical profile and understand why he's going where he is never even hit 800 yards in a season the routes numbers aren't even huge at michigan state or then when he transfers to florida state i don't know if that's injuries or what but i mean it's not even like we saw the teams that have him play him a bunch we talked about some of those concerns as well um it's it's just concerning for me that he wasn't you know like the alpha on his team that that this johnny wilson was getting so much more volume the other guy, Sean, Lad McConkey, another guy who didn't run a lot of routes. I think my understanding is that's a lot more injury related, but two seasons, his first year and his third year where the routes are very low, sub 200. His middle year in 2022, about 350 routes, still pretty low, lower than the two Keon Coleman seasons I was just saying are kind of low. Um, the big thing with him, he's a white dude, but everyone wants to say, you know, don't pigeonhole him as a white dude. He's not a white slot receiver. His ADOT was over 12, both of his final two years. Vertical, athletic, um, sol- three straight solid targets per out run seasons by comparison to Keon Coleman. I mean, he they're kind of in the same range, but is he McConkey's better all three years than, than Coleman is at similar ADOTs. Um, and then he's also a lot more efficient. His yards per target after earning the volume is way higher. And you're also talking about Lad McConkey competing with Brock Bowers prior to that competing with A.D. Mitchell. Uh, I mean, this is Georgia. They have other superstars. Obviously, Florida State's a really good program as well. But um, McConkey earns volume per route despite the low route numbers in a way that is impressive knowing what the competition was there at Georgia. But the overall sample isn't strong. I just said for Coleman, never had an 800-yard season neither did McConkey. for McConkey, some of that's injury related in those things i'm a little more inclined to rely on the per route stuff for McConkey and be a little bit more optimistic especially because he he brings some efficiency at a little bit of a better you know target earning level the the yards per route run where you combine both of those things better in all three seasons than all three of keon coleman's seasons i'm not really trying to compare these two because i think McConkey's profile is a lot better on paper frankly um but it's it's tough when the overall routes aren't huge. We just don't have a huge sample of who this player even is. But from what we can see, he looks good, and the scouts seem to love him too. They do. It it seems very overly enthusiastic because you just don't have the full sample of production. I mean, you you get these guys criticized who, you know, like Odunze, for example, who puts up a huge total in 2023 in part because Washington's passing offense was so prolific that can be a tiny red flag but on the other like extreme end I mean, if you go through your college career and actually are not able to put up raw totals that bothers me but when you look to that final year I mean, he just doesn't play that much you have the 131 routes because of the injury but I mean you're at over three and a half yards per route I mean, you did what you could do when you were on the field. And I mean, you look at the previous season where he actually does have a, a decent total, 91% on target catch percentage that year. You mentioned that the A dot was good. It, this isn't like a. If you're thinking, well, the thing that most people probably think in terms of Wes Welker and Julian Edelman, it's not really that. Now, that wouldn't be a problem if you could actually go out and be those guys. <laughs> But the, I mean, the two prospects who pop up as the like the most exciting physical comps are Garrett Wilson and Chris Olave, right? I mean, nobody is saying that those guys are, you know, Wes Welker. Now, a little bit of that is is almost because outside of the forty, you know, Wilson and Olave didn't test that well either. And outside of the forty, you know, McConkey's testing is just, you know, fine. It's very bland. So I don't think that you should be thinking this guy 
is some like freak athlete either. I mean, he's a small, fast guy, which there is very clearly room for that to work at the NFL level. And on a team where, you know, again, and we've got someone like Brock Bowers, for example, stepping on the volume that's there. And, and we know that it, it, vaguely similar ways to Michigan. I mean, Georgia is just mauling their opponents. And so it's not necessarily a system where you're going to go out and put up 1500 yards. I, I, so much of this for me actually boils down again to the fit and then to the price, because if McConkey with these raw totals is drafted at the end of the first round in reality, and then becomes that like the price that would reflect that in fantasy, it's going to be hard for me to have a lot, but he's also somebody where, I mean, there, and, and maybe this is completely meaningless. I would like to point, put this out as a comment that's probably meaningless, but he's someone who's off season. I'll be tracking the camp and that sort of thing. If he follows up all of the kind of trendiness and buzz right now, by dominating camp this fall, then I think you feel more comfortable and you're going to have to pay more if he dominates camp. But at that point, you know, I would feel comfortable going out there and getting the decent shares. That's a great way of putting it. Um, another one sort of like Leggett that is intriguing. I actually ranked them back to back. They're intriguing to me, but I think uh, your points about the landing spot and how the off season comes together. And, you know, this is the kind of guy that you're not going out of your way to get a ton of. There's been a lot of guys that have had little bits of their profile that look this good. And then some of the other stuff just gets ignored. And, and some of that other stuff might prove to be sort of why he's not successful if that's what ends up happening. Um, but if we do get all those other positive indicators from the draft, after the draft in training camp, there's at least enough here that we can be excited. So that's, that's kind of a cool thing. It is. It is. And to have a, a, this many people to pick from this many guys who could go in the first 45 picks of the reality draft. And there are a couple other names that we'll probably talk about more as draft season goes along, who might also sneak into that range. I, I love that because you, you have a chance. If you want to trade down in your rookie draft, you can do it. If you want to balance your exposures in best ball, you can do it. It just makes for a lot more fun experience than there being a couple guys. And you're like, well, these are the guys you have to pick. And if they miss, then you're just not going to get much rookie production from this particular season. 2024 should be a lot of fun from that perspective. Ben, this has been our longest podcast. And in part, because we're going to experiment with, a slightly new approach before I wrap us up, take us through what our thought process is and what we might do for a while, seeing whether or not it works. Yeah. We're going to try to just do some of these longer ones. We're always kind of trying to cut stuff down and make it shorter. We both are pretty analytically focused. I, I know I always wind up going pretty long with my con comments, um, but we're going to try to just let ourselves do the longer pods, but then also break them up into some shorter segments as well because we know that there are a lot of people that don't have the time to listen to a two-hour podcast and so some of the stuff you'll see on the feed will be uh repetitive if you're listening to every word of the longer pods it's going to be sometimes like some shorter versions of those but they're kind of like uh for the weeks when you don't have an opportunity to listen to the really long pod they're kind of like an opportunity to catch the best parts if you will there's always going to be some stuff in the longer pods that aren't going to make it into the shorter ones and so trying to do a little bit of everything for everyone. You know, we're trying to, we know that there's people that want us to really go into this stuff and they want as much to opinions as they can get. And there's other people that, and, and this is true of all podcasts, want things to be a little more concise and a little tighter. And so we're going to try to hit both of those at the same time. And, and part of it is just for us, Sean, we've talked about this a bunch over the years, but from day one, we started this pod because we like to have these long conversations about football and, and we would have some good ones on the phone and that kind of thing. It's a little harder for our style to try to fit it into a specific uh, topic and a specific time. And this, I think, is going to be great for the people that love our conversations where we can go off on our little tangents and things and, and um, not try to stay too tight with things and just see where the conversation takes us. I'm looking forward to that element of it. I'm also looking forward to this idea of having more targeted pieces. So if you don't have a big block of time, you can find the show that works for 
that day. And so just for example, I mean, this show will probably be a segment at the beginning where we talk about how we evaluate draft prospects, and then it'll probably be broken down into two or three other segments where you get more targeted information on the guys you're looking at. And hopefully, uh, as I put together some of the titles for the pieces, <laughs> they'll be fun enough, but also informative enough that you'll be able to find what you're looking for there. So Steel the Banana Shorts, probably something that uh, you'll see in your feed. That's what they're going to be about. And we're excited. We'll see how long we do it. Uh, but that, Ben, has been just a, a fantastic couple hours for me personally. I love to get to hear your thoughts on everything related to football and fantasy football, but certainly prospects. Your article, Looking at the Top 10 wide receivers is out i encourage everybody to get over to stealing signals check that out as we've also mentioned those sort of tentpole target per route run pieces are up they are fantastic uh blair's working on an article where he links to that in his uh, we don't necessarily link to a ton of outside stuff but certainly your work <laughs> qualifies there uh get over there subscribe to stealing signals subscribe to stealing lines subscribe to stealing signals gold uh, and also follow Ben at Yards Per Gretch. We'd love to have you guys over at Rotoviz. Our new coupon code is RV Radio 2024 at checkout. That gets you 10% off a one year subscription. And the rookie guide that we've discussed, been discussing some pieces from, there are three different editions of that. The first two are now out. The second one obviously comes out after the combine. The third will come out after the draft. $20 buys you all three. Head on over there. We, uh, like we said at the beginning, I, I enjoyed the process of putting it together. I hope you will too. This is going to come out through the course of next week as Ben is on vacation. And then we will be back with you again after that. So we will see you soon. Good luck. We love you guys. Talk to you then.